الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد All praises due to Allah we praise him and we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his companions, his wives and all those who follow them on the righteous path until the day of recompense. Brothers and sisters in Islam, welcome to this episode. I'm your host, Abu Musa Abwajdi Akari. To my right is uh, Brother Abdurrahim Green and uh, Brother Salim Al-Amri and Brother Asim Al-Hakim. And we will be discussing a very hot topic. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, Ya ayyuha nasu taqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa. O mankind, Protect yourselves from the punishment of your Lord who created you from a single soul, our father Adam, and from him he created his partner. And from them he dispersed many men and women upon earth. The idea of men and women coming together in a lawful manner under legal wedlock is an issue that requires a lot of elaboration. And this will be an attempt, bi'idhnillah, we ask Allah's facilitation and aid, to address some of these critical issues pertaining to marriage. And perhaps uh, Brother Abdurrahim would like to give us some preliminary comments on the issue of uh, marriage. Well, continuing from what, what you said, as we know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that marriage is half of um, our deen. So, yes, we need to look after the other half of the deen, but it's really significant to think half of the deen, that's a lot. What makes marriage half of the deen? Why is it something so significant? Why is it something so momentous that the Prophet ﷺ described it as that? So I think that's something for us to think about, inshallah. Most likely, um, when you look at the hadith, it's a authentic hadith. The Prophet ﷺ, whoever gets married, then he has secured half of his deen, so he should fear Allah in the other half. Why would marriage be half of the deen? Some of us, those who are married, and I'm joking, huh? so don't take this uh, for its face value. But it's, it's a joke. Some of us may feel it's not. Those who are married would think of marriage as a menace. And the bachelors would think of it as a bless. And it all depends on how you look at the cup, whether it's half empty or half full. But all in all, definitely marriage is a blessing and a favor of Allah Azza wa Jal. Why? Allah Azza wa Jal described this to us in the Quran when he said that all oh, you uh, people that Allah Azza wa Jal, among his signs that he created for you your spouse uh, so that you may find repose, repose mm. uh, compassion and mercy and affection so it is a blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal, but to explain it this would take ages going back to brother Abdurrahim's hadith that he quoted why is marriage half of the deen. Scholars say that the sources of all evil usually are originating from one's mouth and one's private parts. And that is why in the hadith the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever preserves these two things, these two organs, I'll guarantee for him Jannah. I'll guarantee for him paradise. And what are these two things? Your what's between your jaws and what's between your legs or thighs or whatever. So when you get married, half of this is secured. Mm -hmm. So one would not look around, he would not think of fornication or adultery because this part of his desire, which is a great bulk of his desires, has been secured. The other half, it is what a person should fear Allah Azza wa Jal in the things that he say, in the things that he consumes, and his financing, etc. And all this is part of ha the other half of the deen. Brother Salim, what are your comments on, he, the Sheikh mentioned in regards to that it's half, and that once one secures that, then one shouldn't be uh, going out and looking elsewhere. But we find uh, that people still do that, and they're not satisfied. It seems that there's lack of satisfaction, even though they're married. 
What do you think is the reason why people continue to behave in this fashion? Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi man wala man attaba'ahu da ilayhi muddin. Amma ba'd. First of all, the philosophy of marriage created you in pairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything in pairs. Everything. I mean, kullu shayin khalakna zawjayin ithnayin. From everything we created them in pairs. Wa khalaknaakum azwaja. We created you in pairs. From human beings, the kingdom of animals, plants, male, female, going to the atom, even, neutron, protons, electrons, even in the subshells of the atoms. So everything Allah created in pairs. And the humankind, the purpose of the marriage is not the fulfillment of the biological needs. That's a byproduct. The real aim and objective is to save the human race from extinction. Otherwise, no marriage will be just like other species. They don't exist anymore. So the marriage is a must. It's a need. Otherwise, the human being, they will reach a state, they don't exist anymore. They will reach extinction, become extinct. And that's why now many of the thinkers, they realize this fact. Because of this promiscuity and freedom of fulfilling the bi biological needs, people, they, they don't get married. And they don't want to have children because having children is a responsibility. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planted in each one that natural affinity and inclination towards the opposite sex. Zina linnas hubbu shahawat. Allah has beautified and adorned the love of lusts. This inclination towards the opposite sex. So they have to meet. But under guidelines. Under the guidelines. Mm. And that's the marriage. So that they will have children. It has a responsibility, but the fitra, this instinctive feeling and this innate feeling, drives you towards that. And this is the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a matter of just have a girlfriend and boyfriend and that's it and fulfill your needs. You should have children, otherwise there will be a gap. Because those people, this couple, they will age. And now this is a fact, this is the dilemma now they are facing. They are starting, eh, we have done something wrong. So where is this gap? Who's going to fill this gap? No one. And that's why in Islam, alhamdulillah, Muslims, mashallah, they are multiplying. And because this is the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are fulfilling the wish of their Prophet sallallahu when he said, Tazawwaju, tanakahu, tanasalu, fa inni mukathirun bikum al umam yawm al qiyamah. So he wants us to reproduce. To reproduce, to multiply, and to marry those who are prolific. And he wants us that our number to outnumber the, the number of the believers on the day of resurrection. So this is the aim of the marriage in, and in Islam and uh, in, in general. Beautiful. Regarding why people, that was your question, right? Correct. You see, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this uh, desire it has to be vented in one way or another. So the way to satisfy your biological needs is through the marriage. And Allah giving the man the permission to marry up to four. If one wife is, is not sufficient, then you have the second, third, and fourth one. What about if the wife is not sufficed by one husband? And uh, there's a lot of people who will ask this question genuinely, yeah. not just to be done. That goes against the nature of a woman, actually. The nature of a woman is not like the man. Even her desire is not like the man. She will reach a certain age when that desire will start to diminish. Not like you, you will be in your 60s and your 70s, okay, and you are still reproducing. You're gonna, this is... You're going to cause us a lot of problems with, with okay, the... Okay, it sentence. is true, it is a fact. And alhamdulillah, I'm saying this now. Uh, my youngest sister now, she is only one year. Inshallah. And my dad is already in the 70s. Inshallah. So Allah knows. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows. But there's a fact, I'm sorry for interruption, but... 
we understand that we could say generally, yes, generally. people are like that. Now, you will find women who will beg to differ, and they will tell you, well, I know myself. And no, no, so the, you see, there are always really exceptions. Okay, there, okay, so how do we address we are talking about the exceptions? Yes. Here, the taqwa, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm -hmm. because the shaitan, as uh, Imam ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, shaitan reaches one's heart via two openings, the gate of desires and the gate of That's doubts. We'll be back shortly, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A way of life, a way of life. There is a need to see what Islam says about human rights. Kindness and care, justice for peace, human brotherhood. The book of Allah, the glorious Quran, and the Sunnah of the Prophet protecting humanity at large and promoting peaceful coexistence. These are the two main sources for getting the human rights. Dr. Ahmad ibn Safuddin. Islam has come with a complete system of protecting human rights under the Sharia. Realize the progressive Islamic insights in human rights, a Muslim perspective, every Monday at 8 p.m. and repeat telecast at 11.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Most countries of the world ban bullying. They hit in their schools and universities. A lot of us are being bullied differently every single day. Some come up to us and say, do this, while others say, don't you dare. Some say this is halal, halal, halal. while others say, nope, this is haram. haram. Are, you confused? Are you confused? Do you feel lost? Join me in Umdat al-Ahkam, where, with the grace of Allah, we will learn the proper knowledge from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah, which would help stop this kind of bullying. Join Asim Al-Hakim in Umdatul Ahkam next on Peace TV. A way of life, a way of life. Welcome back. So, we were saying that the shaitan, as uh, Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, shaitan reaches one's heart via two openings. The gate of desires and the gate of doubts. doubts. Two gates. Hawat and Shubuhat. Exactly. So to lock the gate of the doubts, the remedy is the ilm, the knowledge. To lock the gate of desires is the taqwa, the fear of Allah. So when my nafs dictates to me, look at this, watch this, Allah is watching me. What if I die now? Allah is watching me. So it is the taqwa, the fear of Allah, that will prevent you from indulging into sinfulness. Perhaps you can add that the women, the, the, let's say those exceptions to the rule, who may be listening and saying, well, you know, this and that. We say, yeah, if you look at one aspect, let's say the physical aspect, uh, let's say a woman may have such tendencies. But when it comes to the responsibilities, you know, that come along with marriage, if a woman were to have four husbands, which means she has to f cook for four different men, and she has to do the house chores and whatever will come along with it, one is, is plenty of, of headache, let alone two or three or four. See, that actually goes against the nature of any decent woman. Right. Any decent woman will be offended if you tell her there are a hundred men waiting for you in the Jannah. She will be offended because a woman who loves her husband wants to be with her husband. Subhanallah. No. This is her nature. The sound but fitra. Allah who created, he knows. But the man, when you tell him there are huriyat, you see a proud smile on his face. It's very true. But I think, brother, you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, maybe many audiences in the West would even not uh, really relate to your idea that women are in Working. the home cooking for their husbands and for husbands cooking for them because women, a lot of them are out working. So you're using a bit of, for some people, what might be an outdated cliché. Uh, especially if you're talking about women with a type of appetite, you know. But I think there's a whole other way we could look at this topic. And I think it's really nice sometimes to go, let's go back to the very basics. Why has Allah given us a deen? Why, why did Allah give us a way of life in the very first place? 
So if the Prophet ﷺ is telling us that marriage, if it's half of your religion or half of your way of life, I think this is a nice way, better way to translate it, the way of life that is ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the purpose of life from the beginning? It's to worship Allah, which is as Ibn Abbas said, to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think there's a whole spiritual dimension to marriage as well, um, to do with our psychology as human beings, to do with our spirituality as human beings. And I think this is uh, something very profound, uh, that this deen that Allah has, this way of life Allah has given us, Islam, is for the happiness of the human being. The happiness of the human being individually and collectively. One of the things that I think is a message that we have to get through, especially to people in the West today, and in fact in the whole world, because we have got used to this idea that we should just follow our desires, that happiness comes from just doing whatever you feel like. And this propaganda that everybody is exposed to the whole time of, you know, of sexual, open sexuality, you know, promiscuity, the whole materialistic concept is really about following your desires. But when we look at a deen, any religion, but specifically Islam, it's a lot to do with controlling your desires, disciplining yourself, living within a framework of rules and regulations. But actually it's very interesting that more and more evidence, scientific evidence in this developing field of psychology shows that actually human beings are most happy when they are living within the context of these disciplines. And that actually by controlling ourselves and disciplining ourselves, uh, we find a really more profound happiness. And I think what we find in Islam is marriage is the context within which that can happen. So it, it really also, it's a an arena where we can draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very important. At the end of the day, that's what it's bringing us closer to Allah. We know more about Allah. We are grateful to Allah. And I think this is all what marriage helps us as well. Yes, mm -hmm. You just reminded me with mm -hmm. the, what Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said. Towards mm -hmm. the end of his life, he said, By Allah, I force myself. You see, I force myself. Not that I have appetite, that I have a desire, no. But I force myself, okay, to come in contact with my partner, hoping that Allah will bring from my loan one soul that will worship Allah. We were saying that marriage, are you obliged to get married? Is it optional? What do you think? Or what does Islam say, in better words? Well, Islam encourages people to get married. And the question whether it's obligatory or recommended or forbidden even, it depends from case to case. You mm -hmm. cannot just give a ruling for all, one size fits all. Islam encourages marriage, and this goes without any uh, doubt. The Prophet himself, والسلام, addressed the youth by saying, Ya ma'ashar al-shabab, O oh, you youth, whoever is capable of getting married, he should do so. Why? He justifies والسلام, by saying, because it is best for you to be able to lower your gaze and to preserve your chastity. When you're married, you don't look around. Your passion and desire has been already filled. And that is why in another hadith, the Prophet said that if you go out and you see something you like and your desires are arose, so you go back to your house, meet your spouse, and then, alhamdulillah, you fulfilled your desire because what the one on the street has, it's the same thing with your spouse. So. It's logical. Alhamdulillah, our religion is not something, it is not uh, rocket science. It is natural. It is addressing your desires. So the Prophet is telling the youth to get married so that they can be able to lower their gaze and preserve their chastity. What about those who can't get married, either financially or because of the culture? Or And I get a lot, and all of you guys get a lot of questions and emails saying that my father does not want me to marry this person because he's from another sect and I have this desire and I have this and that. What to do, the Prophet says, fast. He's giving the solution for the youth. When you fast, you reduce the means of shaitan to you and your desire gets less. So this is time bound, inshallah, until you are able to get married. Marriage becomes obligatory when you have money and you have physical capability, and there is the fear of you falling into sin. 
And you say, well, I don't want to get married until I finish school, until I get my PhD, until I become the CEO, until I become one of the 100 top in Forbes magazine. You're going to die and you're not getting married. What is this? You must. It's mandatory for you to get married. But it also can't be forbidden. If someone has a wife like you guys, and you want to get married to a second wife, but you know you're not capable financially or physically, or you're unable to satisfy your first wife in terms of spending the time with her and with the kids, so you say, okay, I'm going to spend like three nights with the first and one night with the second, and inshallah, Allah will forgive me. Here, this marriage becomes forbidden because Allah Azza wa made it a clear-cut uh, condition that if you're unable to be fair and just to more than one wife, then it becomes haram for you to, to get married again. And likewise, if you want to say if it's recommended or if it's not recommended or if it's permissible, it falls under this category. Is it haram or not recommended? No, it is haram for you if you're unfair and just. Haram if he's going to fall into yeah, yeah. being and unjust. Yeah. Uh, this is what I said. If a person knows if he gets married to a second wife and he will not be fair, he, he is saying that I will not be fair. I the, know this. Now, this fairness or justice, material justice, things regarding 10 to... Three nights and one night. Three nights for the first wife yeah. and one night for the second wife. And then three nights for the first wife without any agreement. But if they accept? If they accept, it's a different issue. Uh, this so will you, get us to... Yeah, that's a whole yeah. discussion. Yeah. But I think what might be worth pointing out as well, I'm sure people are thinking of the famous uh, hadith where the three young men came to ask the family of the Prophet wasallam about how was the life of the Prophet and you know his worship. And when they heard, they said, who are we compared to the Prophet? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah has forgiven his, you know, mistakes Previous from time. before and after. So one of them said, you know, I will fast every day. Another one said, I will never sleep in the night, I will pray all the night. And the other one said, I will never marry the women. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard this, he was very upset. He called the people, it was his habit, and he said, who is Falan, Falan who says this and that? He says, I fast some days and I don't fast some days. And I sleep in the night and I pray in the night and I marry the women. So whoever does not follow my sunnah has got nothing to do with me. And I think some people use this as, you know, they use this to establish that if you don't get married, you're not following the sunnah and therefore you have nothing to do with the Prophet wasallam. I think the first thing I want to point out about this before I hand it over to you for further explanation is uh, something that is very clear from this is celibate, thinking that being celibate is an act of piety. And this is something you find in some religions. For example, there is a tradition of celibacy, obviously in Christianity, specifically in the Roman Catholic faith and also the Greek Orthodox faith of monks being celibate. But also you find this tradition amongst any, many ascetics like the Hindus and the yogis. They have this idea of celibacy as an act of piety to God. So it's very clear that this is not a way that is pleasing to God, you can't draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through purposefully being celibate. But how else would we explain this statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Some people may take this as a clear indication that it's haram not to get married. Let me add something here. There's no room for celibacy in Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made it very clear to Uthman ibn Madhra. Okay, so there's no celibacy in Islam. That's number one. The marriage, it is the one of the sinan al-fitrah. Sinan al-fitrah means the things that are natural and innate, and it, they are obligatory, the sinan al-fitrah. So we have to understand this. The prophets and messengers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned them with their, their examples. They have families. They children. had progeny, of children, yeah. offspring. The Prophet وسلم, was encouraging the, us to reproduce and to have more children so all these things come together they give us the idea about the ruling of the marriage in Islam the issue that the jurist discuss is it obligatory or is it recommended uh, we, uh, we've uh, covered a few points
but I believe there are more. But the time for the episode is about to end. In fact, it's ending right now. So inshallah ta'ala, in the next episode, we will uh, pick up from where we left off. Wa jazakumullah khairan for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A way of life, a way of life, a way of life, a way of life, Islam is.